The German soldier's shovel pierces the soft loam. For the last year, he has worked on a farm in the southern United States, transferred to a labor detail after several months in a detention center. He and his fellows have spent their time laboring in the fields, watching American films, and thinking about what they'll do once the war is over. The Americans work their charges hard, but they are fed well and are treated better than the black sharecroppers who labor alongside them. Perhaps, our soldier thinks, he will have a new trade to practice when he returns home. The German soldier's shovel strains against the frozen earth. For the last year, he has worked in a graveyard in the Soviet Union, transferred to a labor detail after several months in a detention center. He and his fellows have spent their time shunting frozen corpses, languishing in Spartan barracks, and fighting desperately to survive. The Soviets work their charges hard, but the privations of war mean the communists can barely feed themselves, much less prisoners of war. Perhaps, our soldier thinks, he will soon join his former comrades who stare blankly at him from the pit. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. When VE Day was declared in 1945, the Allied powers held roughly 11 million German soldiers as prisoners of war. The vast majority of these, close to 8 million, had been captured by the Western Allies, while the remaining 3 million were in the custody of the Soviet Union. With Europe liberated from Nazi aggression, the Allied powers were left with a critical question what to do with their 11 million POWs. The issue was a divisive one to say the least, as while the Western Allies were signatories to the Geneva Convention, which very clearly demanded the release of prisoners the moment the war ended, the Soviets had notably abstained from signing the international agreement. This meant that a captured German soldier's fate was ostensibly decided by whose hands they fell into. But war is a brutal business, and sometimes even international law is just ink on a piece of paper. In today's episode, we will examine the various ends a German soldier could meet after 1945, as well as the fates of some of Germany's war criminals. If you hadn't guessed already, war can be a stressful business. Soldiers on an extended tour of duty have to face many hardships, but there is one that rarely gets the consideration it deserves, male pattern baldness. Unfortunately for the soldiers of the Second World War, the internet wouldn't be invented for another 50 years, so they had no way to know about today's sponsor, Keeps. Keeps is a subscription service focused on making it easy for men seeking treatment for baldness online. With a variety of treatment options using affordable versions of FDA-approved medications for hair loss, Keeps offers an accessible service and helps you stay safe at home with 24-7 access to an online Keeps doctor to monitor your progress and answer any questions you might have. With more five-star reviews than any of its competitors, Keeps is the logical choice for any man looking to preserve his hairline through a difficult peacetime. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash armchairhistorian or click the link in the description below to receive 50% off of your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash armchair historian. In February of 1945, the big three Allied leaders, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Premier Joseph Stalin met at Lavadia Palace in Crimea. This Yalta conference was meant to decide the ultimate fate of a defeated Germany. A key point of the agreement among the three men was that their foe must be brought to heel and rendered unable to threaten the world for a third time. In addition to dividing Germany into occupation zones and the idea of monetary reparations, the big three agreed that the German people themselves must be made to physically repair the damage their nation had done to Europe. This included conscripting POWs for forced labor, a practice Stalin and his advisors thought necessary and Roosevelt and Churchill regarded with tacit acceptance, but more on that later. 
During the war years, German soldiers were imprisoned in roughly 20 countries around the world, including in the continental United States. While stateside, many German prisoners were leased out to farms or factories to serve as laborers, providing additional hands to make up for the workers lost to the draft. A hotbed of this leasing activity was the southern U.S., where German POWs befriended American citizens and watched Hollywood films during their off hours. Overall, POWs sent to the U.S. were treated humanely, and deaths of Germans in American custody were low at 491. Things were different in the internment camps in Europe, where American estimates for POWs who died in custody lie in the low thousands, while German tallies claim up to 40,000 fatalities in American custody. The Americans' early release of many prisoners complicates attaining an exact number. For their part, the British Empire managed the fate of up to 2.5 million German POWs by the war's end. Germans kept in Great Britain could be housed in anything from tents set up in a pastoral field to elegant manor houses repurposed as surprisingly posh prisons. Similar to their comrades in the US, German POWs in Britain enjoyed a cordial relationship with British civilians who gave them money and foods that they were not usually fed. Germans in Britain could also be put onto a labor detail, for which they were paid a respectable two shillings per day of work. The number of German POWs who died in British custody was 1,254. British soldiers, as well as American, were also reported to have engaged in torture when interrogating Germans suspected of committing war crimes, often leading to confessions extracted under duress. But this was far from the worst a German captured on the Western Front could expect. That dubious dishonor lies with France, German soldiers captured during the liberation of France, as well as a number relocated there from American custody, faced abysmal conditions and vengeful civilians. French citizens would verbally harass or assault German prisoners, stoning or beating them, sometimes to death. Some POW camps seemed designed for extermination rather than detention. A French camp in the Saat gave its inmates only 900 calories worth of rations per day. For comparison, a Jew living in the early days of the Warsaw Ghetto was, on paper at least, allotted just over 1,000 calories of rations by the Nazis. An average of 12 POWs died daily at the Saat camp, and shortly after VE Day, the Red Cross reported that almost 200,000 German soldiers in French custody faced imminent starvation. The United States was forced to halt any further shipments of POWs to France and mandate their adherence to the Geneva Convention, an act that, in practice, was largely symbolic. The end of the war meant, according to international law, repatriation. But for the Western Allies, the end of the war largely seemed to mean reparation. The US and Britain leased roughly 1 million German POWs to the French to rebuild their country, while 64,000 went to Belgium, 10,000 to the Netherlands, and 5,000 to Luxembourg. Germans on the continent would assist in reconstruction, building roads or working in sawmills and quarries. Some in France and the Netherlands were made to clear minefields. 2,000 POWs were killed or maimed each month doing this. Conscripting the workers this way was a clear violation of the Geneva Convention, but the Western Allies claimed that since the German government technically did not exist, their charges were not prisoners of war and therefore were not entitled to the protections afforded to POWs. The Soviets had suffered greatly in their war against fascism, and they did not want a pound of flesh for their trouble. They wanted tons. Soviet plans for post-war reconstruction included the use of German POWs as forced labor as early as 1944. Ivan Maisky, Soviet ambassador to the British Empire, called for the Germans to be given as reparations to the Soviet Union for a lengthy period, which he ultimately defined as 10 years. Maisky would refine his proposal for the Yalta Conference and provided Stalin with a full-scale plan to get the USSR a supply of 5 million German POWs to be used as forced labor for a decade after victory was achieved. 
With this mass conscription and the planned seizure of German land and wealth, the Soviets hoped they could keep the German people from ever fighting against the USSR again. With the war's end and the carving of Germany into occupation zones, the Soviet plans were put into effect. Soviet authorities began identifying their new charges, with ethnic Germans in Soviet territory investigated to determine if they had served in the war. Any who had verifiable Wehrmacht service were ordered to Soviet POW camps to be prepared for forced labor. The Soviets would organize their new workers into battalions of three to 5,000 men divided into 1,000-man companies. They were primarily used for construction and heavy industry, with a laser focus on rebuilding the utterly devastated Soviet Union. Three million Germans would be drafted into the Soviet labor companies. A full third would die there. It should be noted, however, that this may not have been the result of direct Soviet action or negligence. Theirs was a war of annihilation, where both German and Soviet gave no quarter and expected none. Consequently, a number of the men forced into these labor companies were POWs captured by the Soviets directly, and due to the horrible conditions of the Eastern Front, came into Soviet custody malnourished, sick, utterly exhausted, or some combination of the three. But it would not have been pragmatic for the Soviets to intentionally slaughter their newly acquired labor pool so shortly after a war that devastated their working population. From 1945 to 1946, many POWs who were too sick to work were simply released by the Soviets rather than be worked to death. A bad harvest and endemic corruption and mismanagement seemed to be behind the travails of German forced laborers in the early post-war years. However, as time wore on, the German laborers began to prove more trouble than their Soviet masters thought them worth. POW labor was a surprisingly expensive enterprise and had to constantly be subsidized by the main Soviet economy. The Germans contributed roughly 5% of the Soviet Union's total national income, a far cry from the grand reparation envisioned by Maisky and his 10 years of servitude. In a surprisingly capitalist move, Soviet industrial leaders began to see their German workers as unprofitable and began to skimp on their responsibilities to feed and care for them. After all, why waste good money and materiel on what they saw as fascist parasites? As their industrial managers began to sour on the concept, Soviet leaders began making moves toward repatriation. In 1947, the foreign ministers of the Allied powers agreed that they would repatriate all German POWs by 1948. The Soviet effort would last well into 1950, with roughly 26,000 German POWs who had been convicted of war crimes by Soviet courts not sent back to Germany as late as 1956. Overall, Germans in the Soviet Union after the war were faced with mandatory hard labor under challenging conditions, but the majority were repatriated long before the initial plan of 10 years. But what of Germany's soldiers who had been discharged before the war's end, or who had deserted their Führer's crusade against the rest of the world, or who simply had been far enough away from the front lines that they were not captured? Those Germans who escaped capture and who were in the Western occupation zones found themselves cast adrift in a new Germany. The Allies were keen to strip Germany of any martial will, and to this end, of militarism of any military-inclined organization or club. This meant that German veterans of the Second World War, unlike their former foes, had no support system to help them transition back into civilian life. These suddenly demobilized soldiers found themselves in a country gripped by denazification. As the Western Allies sought to purge the influence of Hitler and Goebbels' propaganda machine and eliminate all traces of Nazi ideology and warmongering. To this end, former soldiers were ordered to present themselves to Allied tribunals for summary judgment, 
originally run by the occupying forces before being handed off to German authorities in 1946, these tribunals would take stock of the defendant's military and civilian activities during the war. The court would then categorize the defendant as a major offender, offender, lesser offender, follower, or give them a full exoneration. By and large, rank-and-file members of the Wehrmacht were categorized as lesser offenders and sentenced to a three-year period of probation. During this time, they were prohibited from holding public office or running their own businesses. As more and more defendants were found or presented themselves, the tribunal system began to buckle under an ever-growing caseload, and judges began finding or making a multitude of exceptions to speed the process up. Disabled veterans were often exempted from judgment, along with those who could prove that they were impoverished during the war years, or were born after 1919. While this system succeeded in streamlining the process of former Wehrmacht personnel, it allowed those with real Nazi sympathies to slip through the cracks. Denazification was abandoned in the 1950s, as its inefficiencies became more apparent, and the German public began pushing back on the idea of individual culpability. Why reckon with your part in crimes against humanity when you can simply pin it all on a dead Austrian painter and move on with your life? In one of history's moments of irony, many former Wehrmacht personnel, judged by the Allies for their service, would soon find themselves right back in uniform. With the growing threat of the Soviets to the east, the Allied powers realized that a militarized Germany would prove a keen ally should the world descend into another global conflict. The Bundeswehr was established in November of 1955, and many former Wehrmacht soldiers could be found in its ranks, sometimes wielding the same weapons they used to fight against the Allies. The war criminals of Nazi Germany, from the highest echelons of military and civilian leadership to rank-and-file guards, were arraigned on charges of crimes against humanity and prosecuted at a series of trials, most famously at Nuremberg. Prosecutors from all Allied nations presented a preponderance of evidence, ranging from private diaries to ledgers of concentration camps to military dispatches. The prosecution's point was clear. The military was equally responsible for Hitler's horrors as the SS and civilian leadership. There was no distinction to be drawn between the independent and politically minded SS and the duly enlisted soldiers of the Wehrmacht. While separate, these two cogs in Hitler's machine of annihilation would often work in sinister concert. The Wehrmacht would take an area, and the SS would purge it of undesirables. Military officers, such as Keitel, and high ministers, like Ribbentrop, were hanged, while others were sentenced to prison terms, ranging from life to time served. Others, such as Hermann Göring, took their own lives rather than face the hangman. There were even a few female defendants, such as the sadistic hyena of Auschwitz, Emma Grese. Kreza was ultimately hanged for her brutal treatment of concentration camp inmates, unusual for a time when executing women was a stark rarity. But these people were still allowed a defense, and theirs was simple. We were just following orders. The thrust of these arguments was that any Nazi soldier, officer, official, or minister accused of crimes against humanity was simply following a directive from a higher authority. Some, in fact, falsified orders to show that they had no choice in the matter, creating false paper trails to justify their own malice and cruelty toward Jews, Roma, LGBTQ people, and others the Nazi party declared undesirable. Many of these false stories were pushed by the defendants' families who were tired of the war, tired of the reckoning, and just wanted their sons, daughters, husbands, or wives home, whether they were a monster or not. This attitude began to pervade German public consciousness with unfortunate results. In 1949, the Federal Republic of Germany was founded, a new German state for a new German people, 
The first chancellor of this new Germany, Konrad Adenauer, opened his tenure by announcing plans for a general amnesty for war criminals who had been sentenced by the occupying powers. The desire for Germany to be an ally against possible Soviet aggression trumped the desire for justice, and spring of 1950 saw the Advisory Board on Clemency for War Criminals established to review cases for leniency. 105 cases were brought to the advisory board in August of 1950 as family and friends of convicted war criminals, as well as representatives of the new German government, presented all manner of mitigating evidence, from medical history to the newly birthed clean Wehrmacht myth, which stated emphatically that all Nazi crimes were the fault of the SS and Hitler's inner circle. Proponents of the clean Wehrmacht myth argue to this day that the common soldier of Nazi Germany was an honorable, chivalrous man, fighting for home and hearth, untainted by the atrocities of his peers and the hateful rhetoric of his leaders. 84 of the 105 cases heard by the advisory board were dramatically lessened or outright commuted, and the fairy tale myth of the Klein Wehrmacht spread through the German populace. Generations of Germans believed in a sharp divide between their ancestors who fought for Hitler and his crimes, eager to compartmentalize the shame of their nation's atrocities and their own family histories. War, like history, is never simple nor clean. The soldiers of Germany captured on the battlefield rightfully expected to be treated in accordance with the Geneva Convention, and in many cases they were, until the war's end. The pragmatic and vindictive moves by the Allies to force German POWs into rebuilding Europe do not excuse the crimes of Nazi Germany, just as Nazi atrocities do not excuse Allied violations of the Geneva Convention. It is imperative that we remember history is not entirely black and white, but rather painted shades of gray, with definite areas of clear morality and humanity. To simplify history into West versus East, good versus evil, or any dichotomy, is to ignore the true lessons our history has to teach us, and the most profound lessons are often to be learned in its darkest chapters.